we are welcoming uh, Professor Karen Akerlof, and it's my pleasure to introduce you today. Um, Karen Akerlof is an assistant professor in George Mason University's Department of Environmental Science and Policy. Her research focuses on the intersection between governance and science and risk communication. She explores this nexus across three areas of study. One, communication of science with policymakers. Two, public participation in decision making. And three, the use of social science with government, within government programs. She leads an environmental science communication concentration within the department's master's program and teaches courses on this topic as well as evidence informed policymaking. Her talk today is entitled Stationarity is Dead Adaptation to a Changing World. Um, welcome, Professor Akalaf. Great. Well, thank you so much for the invitation to be here today. Um, really excited to hear about this event and I'm really excited to join you all today. So I'm going to start with um, the title of my talk, um, which really is kind of the t shirt of our times. Um, the comment that the statement that stationarity is dead. And this was a paper that came out in 2008 um, in science that was specifically about water management, but has a lot further implications, right? Um, so for a lot of the things that we've done over time as a human species, we've been able to make the assumption that natural systems have a certain variability um, but that variability stays pretty much constant, and we can use that as a set of parameters in order to make decisions. And so this paper um, was um, saying, hey, looks, things are changing, folks. Um, so actually, I'm going to throw, I actually, and I, I should have told you, Alexia, um, I'm hoping to get a little bit of interaction with you guys as well. Um, I know it's, um, it's a moderately long talk, um, but to, just to get a sense of where you guys are. Um, so um, if it's okay with you guys, I'll, and you can, if, if you just wanna respond in chat, I'm happy to also, if one or two people wanna to jump in, um, I'll throw in, out questions periodically as well, um, just see if you have thoughts. Um, so can you think of some other, so this is water management. Can you think of some other decisions that we make that assume stationarity? This idea that natural environmental Variation is pretty much stable. Forest management. Um, yeah, and the choice of species, right? Especially for agriculture, really important. Great point. And I'll let you guys, if you wanna think of some few others. But um, probably a lot of what we do, you think about bridges, um, how high do you make the bridge? Um, think about where do we put our roads, right? Um, uh, a lot of the rent system and demography, okay. Um, a lot of the decisions that we make as societies and even as individuals perhaps, like where do we buy our house? Um, infrastructure, great one, beautiful one. Um, really expensive too, right? In the United States, we're talking about big infrastructure bills right now. These are really critical decisions that sometimes have really, really long um, time periods. We make these planning decisions sometimes decades ahead of advance, and then we do not expect to make them again for a long period of time. So um, this is a really big concept and it doesn't just affect water management, right? Um, uh, so in this paper mm -hmm. is making the point that we can't make this assumption anymore, right? So hence, the t-shirt, right? Stationarity is dead. Um, we need to essentially be able to adapt to change and not just one change, right? It's not like climate change is one change, but rather um, we need to be able to adapt to a state of change. Um, and I'm gonna talk about that in one particular context, um, see what arise today. We have a participant who raised her hand. Should I oh, allow her to talk? Yeah, sure. I'll, so Chantal, I'm going to allow you to open your microphone. You should be able to talk. So Chantal, you're allowed to open your microphone. You had mentioned infrastructure. Was that what you were? Um, maybe. OK, well. I would just said, OK. Yeah. <laughs> oh, well. Sorry. OK, so that's uh, it's probably a bug. Um, that's maybe fine. Maybe we can do it through chat and then um, 
Yeah, and then Alexei can pass on any, any questions. Sounds good. Um, so let me just give you a quick kind of overview of what we're going to talk about today. Um, so there's sort of three parts to the talk. Um, and as I said, I hope to throw some questions out for you guys to get feedback from you guys. Um, and the talk is divided into one kind of thinking about, you know, so stationarity is dead, but that wasn't always the case. Um, and to think about sort of on a more meta level, what is it that sort of on the human species, what is, what's in our toolkit to help us with adaptation? Um, and I do have a focus on communication, so I have a bias, you will kind of notice that. Um, so I'm mean, gonna sort of talk about meta. Why is, why is communication? What's, you know, what's the role of communication and adaptation? Then we're going to the second part, um, go more sort of micro and um, talk about some work that we've done. We're looking at individual variables, things like knowledge, things like experience, um, worldviews, um, what roles do they play? Um, in risk perception, um, and particularly on sea level rise um, and with implications for adaptation, and then pull back out at the end again and think about this more of a meta structure again, thinking about what the implications are for policy. So specifically when I'm talking about adaptation, obviously you can, individuals can make in decisions that um, promote their own adaptive capacity, right? They can choose to buy their houses not in places that are to sea level rise, they can change their housing, um, they can uh, make it rise up, they can, um, uh, uh, they might um, engage in all sorts of other activities in their community to help it become more st stronger and more resilient um, as well. I am not going to focus on individual adaptation behaviors, but rather the implications for communicating about sea level rise um, and especially about risk for the purposes of advancing policy. I um, mean, thinking about ad adaptation um, from the lens of policy. So in terms of the setup, um, that's where we're gonna start off. So I mean, adaptation is a relatively wonky term, right? Um, and it's a relatively new term on the scale, at least for most of the public has never heard of it and is still a little bit iffy on it. Um, but the problem itself, right, is pretty old. So we've gotten pretty used to, you know, in the last um, 10,000 years-ish to fairly stable environments, right? Um, but if you look over the entire course of human history, that's not actually true. Um, so environmental change was a part of um, sort of planetary systems and human beings dealt with it over longer periods of time. Um, but in sort of also in different, over different types of timescales. And so this is just a review article. I am, this is not my area of study, but I do think it's helpful to think about what are the roles of especially communication and cooperation, its relationship to it, um, um, coming from a sort of a thinking about it over a greater expanse of time. And if you, so this is a review paper, thinking about the role of environmental change in terms of how it's affected human's adaptive capacity. And you can see this is just, so this isn't necessarily tracking, right, that there were specific environmental changes that occurred, but, um, but there is a lot of research, as you guys probably know, um, that we do have some senses of when there were big climactic shifts and other types of environmental changes. And there is some indication that these are connected. These environmental changes were then connected to changes in human adaptation. Um, that brought benefits that enabled human beings to better survive these changing contexts. And one of the first ones you can see highlighted in yellow that you see fairly early in Herman, in, in, <laughs> apologies, human history, um, is that our ability to communicate, um, expand, our ability to be, um, to expand um, uh, our social, um, you know, communication with social groups, our awareness and of, um, of wider um, social contexts is really critical for um, the purposes of cooperation, which really helps us um, in terms of adaptation. So you can see there's you know, a, lot of, a lot of these changes have occurred over time, but what some of the first were these abilities to, um, to communicate better with, especially with wider groups of humans. Um, and this probably really, as you know, as I'm indicating, was likely critical um, for those 
um, early humans um, to survive. So we actually do have, you know, we do have some experience as a human species in environmental change. Um, and specifically, one of the big parts of that toolkit is communication. Um, that, uh, that our ability to cooperate with large groups of people um, to achieve a goal um, requires communication. And so, um, so this, is one, this is the area that I'm going to focus on as we go more into micro and then back out. So what does that mean in this context, in this, this present day context for sea level rise adaptation? So um, thinking about today, um, you know, communication supports adaptation in a variety of different ways. So I'm specific, a lot very interested, especially in how it supports policy and functions of a democracy. Um, but it also supports things like conveying knowledge, right? Um, supporting the development of common cultural values and norms. It also, and this is a key one for um, resilience, it also builds social connectivity, right? Which is a key, um, a key aspect of social capital and also resilience. Um, and it also can promote behavioral changes, right? So if you think about you know, on the individual level all through the organizational level, like, you know, how businesses are changing um, all the way up to entire populations. So it really is um, dynamic in the sense of the impacts that it can have. And obviously it also looks quite, can look quite different in all of these different contexts. Oops. Um, and one thing, this, so this is a, a, a sort of pilot study we had done um, about five years ago, um, working in Maryland. So I would say a lot of the work that I'm gonna show you today is I've worked in the Mid-Atlantic, um, especially in Maryland, ironically, a very small state. Um, I mean, where you guys are all from, um, Maryland's on the Eastern coast. Um, it's an area of the Mid-Atlantic, um, which is also very at high risk for sea level rise. Um, but one of the things that we did at this time, we, um, we did interviews in Baltimore and then also Prince George's County. Um, and then we also did, um, we had a survey in the, in the state of Maryland and we were asking the same questions across um, sort of these delivered surveys in these various different locations. And one of the things we were looking at was um, communication as um, a dimension of resilience or social capital. And you can see, so in these, these were um, fairly underserved Baltimore neighborhoods. There were three of them. One, there was also one neighborhood in Prince George's County. Um, and then you can see sort of the comparison on these various different um, responses on sort of communication, um, the nature of communication in those communities. And you can see in, in both cases, um, these areas, um, these underserved neighborhoods had lower quality communication and trust. Um, and that's a concern because these were also areas that were at relatively high risk for various climate change impacts. Um, so it's, a, again, you know, we think about resilience and adaptation. Um, this is one element um, that, you know, we're concerned about um, potentially, especially being missing in these places, which are at highest risk and are least, least well served currently by society. So that's sort of this, the setup, right? Okay, so communication is really important for the purposes of cooperation, which is going to help us be able to more effectively adapt, right? Um, and this is something that's been in our evolutionary toolbox for quite a long time. Um, so at least we have that in our favor. So. Um, so I want to go talk a little bit about now um, some frameworks that have been used to think about adaptation and um, risk perception, um, and then talk about some studies um, that, um, that I've done in these areas. And again, really focus mostly on um, the Mid-Atlantic and, and Maryland, um, and a few studies that have also looked at case studies more broadly across the country. Uh, um, we have and, a... Oh, yeah, sure. I'm sorry. Sorry to interrupt. We have a question in the chat regarding um, the first part of your presentation, if you're okay to answer it now. Okay, so... Um, I can read it that loud if you want. Sure, that'd be great. Uh, so Mao asked, the idea that communication is necessary for coordinating is very interesting, especially from the human standpoint. But could we remove decision making and thus the heavy lifting of coordination to a central hub, which would contain all information, for example, an AI? That's an interesting point. Um, so I would argue, and I, this is, I'm going to get to this in my sort of my third portion. Um, 
that if you're worried about democratic governance, um, and we know, for example, that AI has biases, right? It's, it's not immune to human bias. In fact, it just, we build it straight in <laughs> um, because it's collecting data from us and we're biased. So um, I, I would say, and definitely you could, right? My concern about it is that um, I'm, I would be concerned about turning democratic governance processes into an AI. Um, I mean, it definitely could, and, and, and unfortunately, we probably will in ways that maybe, you know, maybe not for the, but, but I think you're right. We're probably, you know, it's certainly that capacity is, is already there and it's further developing. But yeah, great point. Um, so my focus, um, obviously, there's lots of ranges of adaptation um uh to a lot of different climate change impacts so this is a, this is from the u.s global change report fairly early in its history and so they were citing you know temperature change global warming i think everybody knows that um uh you know as the as the atmosphere gets warmer it holds more water you get bigger precipitation events um we get more extreme weather right um we also get um, acidification in the oceans, and then we also get sea level rise that's also a component of all this. So it's one of the big impacts that we think about in terms of climate change. Ironically, it's also the one that everybody thinks should be kind of obvious to the public. So temperature, it's a little bit fleeting, right? You know, like some people, if you ask the person sitting next to you, they may think it's hot while you think it's cold. Um, it's a little less tractable, you can't see it, right? Unless you've got a temperature thermometer in front of you and maybe the thermometers differ. Um, the idea is that sea level rise people sometimes assume you literally can see because the water is going up, right? The shoreline, the coastline. So it's it's coming in and you should kind of, as these, these signs sort of represent, you should sort of be able to see it. And if you're living on the coast, you would see that there's less coast there. Um, but that really hasn't been the case. And that's gonna be one of my main messages is that people assume this is kind of the no duh climate change impact and everybody should understand it and get on board. Um, but it's actually relatively low salience for at least for the data that we found. Um, and that's an issue. Um, so that's my first point. But as an impact, it's huge. Um, and the um, one of the reasons why this is potentially a really huge problem um, is that we have very coastal populations and increasingly coastal populations, very big urban populations are located in coasts. So when we get inundation and we get um, nuisance flooding and constant flooding events, we're putting lots and lots of infrastructure, lots and lots of um, uh, very expensive businesses, um, you know, homes, um, lots of money at risk, basically. Um, and so um, a lot of civilization. Um, and so it's a really big problem. And it's also a really big problem for a large number of people. It's also not totally, um, you, it's also somewhat uneven globally as well. I'm gonna be talking about the United States in particular, but if you look at where some of the biggest cities are um, that are at coastal flooding risks, they're actually um, in countries in, um, in Asia. So, I mean, it's certainly affecting the United States, it's affecting places all over the globe. Um, but it's also slightly uneven in terms of um, there are some portions of the globe that will be harder hit. In general, when we talk about this issue, we talk about global average sea level rise. Um, and you can see here, um, if you're a meters person or a feet person, um, so, uh, you know, we're talking about, um, and this is, by the way, this is a U.S. assessment. Um, this is the U.S. National Climate Assessment. Um, and they, they're placing the high range, like, you know, like the really extreme range um, as about eight feet by the end of 2100 um, with lower ranges that are closer to about two. Um, but still that's, a, that's an enormous um, change. And, and it's also aggravated, further aggravated by things like storm surge, et cetera. But the problem is when we talk about this as global sea level rise, um, there actually is no such thing. Like the same way that there is no such thing as global temperature change, um, we don't, ex well, there is, right? But it's a number that we calculate. It's not anything that anybody actually experiences. No one actually experiences global sea level rise rates either. And so this, um, this is just a snippet. Um, and I think this is actually originally a NOAA map, um, again, for the US, apologies. 
um, where you can see the arrows. So with different levels of sea level rise trends. And one of the things you can see too is that some of those arrows are actually going down as in literally sea level rise is going down. So, um, and then some of the arrows are red, which is, um, uh, um, which is much worse. <laughs> so areas like Louisiana um, are looking at much different rates of sea level rise um, than some other areas of the world. Um, so where you are on the planet also makes a huge difference on whether or not, even if you're coastal, uh, sea level rise is going to affect you and at what rate this is going to affect you. So um, there have been, um, this is probably one of the more famous models that thinks about um, what are some of the factors related to individuals' adaptation choices. So Grothman and Pat, it's fairly old, 2005. Um, and for those of you who are all familiar with um, risk perception models, um, especially sort of parallel process risk and epistemy models, this is a little bit of a combination of a couple of them. Um, so perfect, per, um, protection motivation um, by um, Rogers and also Kim Witte has a model, the extended parallel process model, in which you see both of these ideas that people need to perceive a risk, and then at the same time, they make an assessment of their efficacy in actually addressing that risk to do something on to, on to address it. Um, those two things kind of move along together, and then based on a number of factors, including um, Kim Whitty would say to extent sort of fear control versus danger control um, um, is, is influential. People just essentially decide whether or not they're going to um, take, you know, whether they intend to take the adaptation um, action and then whether they actually do that. Um, so as you can see on this, this particular framework, um, you've got risk, right? People's risk perception, their appraisal, to what extent adaptation is going to be effective. And there's various different factors related to risk. So things like their experience of it, their cognitive biases, things like knowledge coming, which this model uses as sort of this objective capacity. And then there are sort of these external forces as well um, in terms of social discourses. So places we also can get information, right? Knowledge, more knowledge, information about what other people are doing, what other people are thinking. So this is one model that I think is useful help with um, sort of help get, you know, what might be some factors related to um, whether or not people choose to make adaptation decisions. Another place to start, and I'm going to talk mostly about risk perception and risk perception related to policy support um, for adaptation um, is comes out of um, Sander van der Linden's work. And I think you guys saw him just a few days ago. Um, so um, I don't know if he spoke of this specifically, but he has this, so he talks about in this, he did a, a meta-analysis of these various determinants of climate change risk perception. So not specific to sea level rise per se, but generally climate change um, and put them into essentially four buckets. The three primary ones being essentially knowledge, then personal experience and various effective components. Um, sort of social cultural factors, um, which he thinks of as norms and values. I also would throw in worldviews, um, and then also demographics um, as one of those. So I'm going to talk about sort of thinking as we work through some of these studies and where, what seems to be influential in ter terms of people's sea level rise risk perceptions. Um, thinking about both of these sort of categories, so that Grothman and Pat, those wider things like social discourses, things like. Um, you know, he puts that knowledge as ob objective, um, social and institutional context, um, and then also thinking specifically about things like knowledge, experience, social cultural factors and demographics. So, as I said, people have a tendency to think that sea level rise is kind of there. It's literally there. If you walk outside the door and if you stand there long enough, you're going to be able to see the change. Um, and even in places where I will say, even in places like the Mid Atlantic of the United States, which have really like we've got about double the rate of global sea level rise, um, they're still talking about relatively small changes over over you know a period of a year. So um, so probably where people are going to find out about this is not necessarily from standing outside, at least in, from year to year, um, but through the media, right? Uh, and so this is. Um, 
I'll, I'll show you some other other data in a second, but this is just looking back, you know, a really quick uh, hack at newspaper articles that address sea level rise, essentially search on sea level rise and the search on climate change. Um, and in these, what we consider in the United States, these are kind of our premier media. Um, so New York Times, Washington Post, USA Today, they're still the biggest newspapers in the United States. Um, so I'm not saying this is, a, this is a very snapshot study. We did a little bit better study um, in a number of different contexts. And you can see there is a, even, you know, in the really re recent decades, um, there's dramatic differences in climate change versus sea level rise co coverage. So I'm going to throw this out to you guys. Um, why do you think that might be the case? Why might, like, if you throw sea level rise and you throw climate change, into database searches for these newspapers, why might you get dramatic differences in the amount of coverage? Yeah, so um, clickbait. <laughs> um, general, okay, so I said somebody, I can't see the full name because um, it's a general term. So that is one potential. So, um, so especially for sea level rise, different places call it different things. So in, the, in some states, they've actually, in, in Virginia, we only were allowed to call it in the government for a while under one, some of the governors, recurrent flooding. Um, coastal flooding is another term. So, so sea level, and some people will dis put distinctions on like coastal flood flooding versus sea level rise. So that's so the terms is a potential place. Um, also, you know, um, potentially global warming, but mainly probably on the, the flooding end, because um, they think that sea level rise alters changes. That's that's a good point too. So they may have a mental model of this thing. Um, climate change has been the principal way to talk about the environment in the last decades. That's another interesting point as well. Yeah, so climate change has been a big, I think, I think you're right, and nailing on that. Um, low coverage because people think there are dikes or other techniques. Uh, they're an interesting point, right? So we have been dealing with, right, we deal with flooding issues fairly frequently. Um, we have government agencies set up to do that kind of thing, to think about building um, defenses. So a lot of, you guys nailed a lot of potential reasons why that might be the case. Um, so we also did another study where we looked um, at, you again, U.S. media coverage in both national and across different um, publications, national and also in cities that were specific hotspots for sea level rise, and we also looked at um, public opinion studies. And the general takeaway was that sea level rise is a pretty low issue, um, salience um, issue, um, that you just, people are not as aware of it as you might think, given that, you know, people think you should just be able to see it outside if you go to the beach. This is just two examples. It happens to be from Maryland and Delaware. It's a little bit old as well. Um, but these were, you can see the differences, especially in Maryland. Um, you can see extremely very sure that sea level rise is happening 18% versus 44% climate change. And think about, again, climate change is supposed to be the, then the very low salience issue, right? People just haven't been, I mean, in, especially you know, we're, get, we're seeing again public opinion, public worry, public concern going up in the United States again. Um, but um, for a very long time, this has been the low salience issue. So saying that sea level rise is lower salience than climate change um, is saying a fair amount. You saw somewhat different, similar things happening in Delaware, but not to the same extent, I think, because of the way that they answered the question more globally. Um, but and even if we look at places like Miami, um, Virginia Beach, where we really are expecting some of the biggest spots we're expecting sea level rise to be impactful in the United States, um, we still see much greater. So in this case, um, uh, the dotted, dotted line is the climate change, global warming, local SLR hotspots. Um, and then the SLR local hotspots is that blue dotted line. And you can see, again, there's a big difference um, we're still seeing more climate change coverage than we are sea level rise coverage, even in places where we know these places are gonna get whacked. So why is that important? So I mean, media is, as I said, is one of the places that we learn about, we learn about new information, we learn about scientific studies, we learn about policy options, but we also learn about what other people think, right? We learn about social 
consensus, what other groups think, what other what our political groups think, the opposition political groups think. So let's just focus on knowledge for a minute. Because so that was one of the things that shows up in the growth minute pat model. It also shows up in the Anderson Linden model about risk perceptions. And so we modeled um, sea level rise belief certainty evaluation of sea level rise consequences. Again, this is in Maryland and looked at attitudes towards policies. It's a, um, a sort of a series of policies we turned into a, an index um, and also issue state issue prioritization. And you can see that like, so the coefficients here are somewhat low, I will admit, um, like 0.13 for sea level rise belief certainty on attitudes for, towards policy. Um, but they are, you do see, so it's not, doesn't explain a ton of um, the model, but it is significant, right? We are, um, and it's, you know, on the scale of also social science where we don't always get a ton of explanatory power. Um, it does look like we have very similar patterns as we might expect in climate change, that it's helpful to know about the issue, right? And to be certain that this is actually something that's happening. And so we'll also know something about the consequences as well. Um, if you expect people to support policy. So I just want to show, this is a map. Um, so that was done, um, then we sort of, we took the, um, we had um, a state survey and we did, um, we essentially did this, the seat mapping based on these two questions. So do you think that sea level rise is happening on Mar Maryland's coastlines? And then also do you think climate change is happening? And you can see we get different impacts. Um, I will just tell you, because you may, may not be really familiar with Maryland, um, the southern, to the eastern shore, which is, I don't know if you guys can see my cursor, on the left, it's that kind of dog leg on the right. That's where um, the biggest inundation impacts from sea level rise will be occurring. And then I'm going to tell you guys, I, I would expect my students to know, but maybe you kind of don't know. If you look at the climate change map, um, you'll see this little box in the middle. That's where Washington DC fits in. And those verbs right around Washington DC are where that hotspot is. So um, what do you, when you look at these maps, what do you think may be going on here? If you had to take some guesses, there's definitely differences in the people who think that sea level rise is happening and climate change is happening. Just if you look at populations. Why do you think you might see those differences? Oh, I apologize, I didn't see anything else. Um, political orientation, yep, you guys are doing great. Political orientation, yeah, so the places right around Washington, D.C. are very liberal. D.C. is very liberal. Um, SES also, um, so in the Eastern Shore tends to be more conservative. SES also, um, probably lower on Eastern Shore. Place of livelihood, yeah, so the people on the Eastern Shore are also, so you're seeing brighter um, colors there. They also are also, um, they do, they're fishers. Um, they do so. Lots of crabbing is really, really important to their livelihoods. Um, perception. Great job. Yeah. So there's potentially a lot to unpack here on what maybe some of these factors in terms of whether or not people are recognizing that these things are happening. So let's talk about some of those other factors, um, especially to worldviews and experience. So and one of you and you guys have brought that up. So experience. These people are living in an area, especially on that eastern part of the eastern shore, that is much more prone to inundation. It's basically the part, um, and I don't have it on this map, but if you look at an inundation map, it goes straight under blue, the first um, place in Maryland. Um, so we did a study in 2016, and this time we were focused on the other portion of the state. Um, um, it's actually the state capital, um, and it's a county, very, very local stuff. And you can see here, uh, mean higher, higher water, it's a little blurry. If it's dark blue or blue, that means it's much more at risk. Green is it's less, somewhat less at risk. So we had risk information um, at a household level, and we also knew like property damage. Um, so we knew flooding risk, we knew where they were relative to mean higher, higher water. So we knew sea level rise risk, and then we also knew the property, potential property damage estimates, um, which we used in this model. And then we also, this is survey data that we paired it with. 
Um, and so we had um, cultural worldview measures on it as well um, and looked at people's perceptions of risks at various different scales. And one of the things that we found, and we weren't actually even sure um, cultural worldviews that have been developed, um, they have a long history that comes out of anthropology and the political science. Dan Kahan at um, Yale has been working with them um, most recently, most famously recently. Um, that we weren't sure if actually if they would be related to sea level rise, they certainly are climate change. And we found that yes, cultural worldviews are very predictive of um, perceptions of sea level rise risks. Um, and also that being at risk, you know, being in these areas that are more likely to be inundated was as well, but that it's also very scale dependent. And I'll show you that in a minute. Um, just for those of you guys who are not familiar, um, the cultural cognition worldviews come out of these ideas um, initially of from anthropology um, that, that societies, groups of people um, have specific ideas about how society should be structured. Um, that can be thought of as in terms of um, hierarchy as one dimension and sort of individualism to communitarianism as another dimension. Really simply, it just means that some people believe that in societies it's okay for some people to have a lot of power and other people not to have a lot of power. And then in, um, on the other dimension, um, some people think that we should do what's best for the community as opposed to other people think, well, no, we should let people have as much freedom as possible to do what they want, they choose to do and not thinking as much about the good of the community. When you split those into two and you, there's measures to do this, um, you can see that especially environments as a whole bunch of it predicts a lot of different types of risk perceptions, but environmental ones are as well. People who are more hierarchical individualists in that upper left-hand corner tend to not be too worried about environmental issues like climate change. Um, they're also not worried about nuclear power, but that's another thing. Um, people who are more communitarian, egalitarianism, it's a mouthful, um, do tend to be much more worried about um, environmental issues. And so that's the, that sort of explains what those things are. Um, and these measures have been shown to actually influence very, very perhaps strangely. So your ideas about social order um, actually are very, have been shown to be influential about percep um, people's perceptions of temperature, drought, flooding, as well as climate change and sea level rise. And so here they were as well, and you can see the cultural worldview that measured at the bottom in that yellow, they were predictive across all, all three sets of models that we ran. We ran this predicting people's perceptions of sea level rise risk to the county, to their neighborhood, and to their own home. And then we used um, also sea level rise risk measures based on their property level. Um, and as you can see um, that, uh, so across the board, cultural worldview measures are predictive of people's risk perceptions across all these different scales. Um, but we only see that actually people's sea level rise risk perceptions are um, predicted by their actual risk at these lower scales, which their home um, and their neighborhood. When you get up to the county level, which is by the way, right, the policy level, that's where sea level, risk, that's the first lowest level a policy where you'd see it, aside from maybe in homeowner association, um, risk doesn't make any difference. Um, actual risk doesn't seem to make any difference to these folks as well. And that's why it's potentially interesting and important is um, the policy scale and the experiential scale completely don't align in this case. So let's go back and think about experience again. Um, so we talked about, you know, um, we talked about like, so it does look like there is an influence and, you know, which makes sense. Um, so in Maryland, um, which is moderately at risk from for sea level rise, when you ask people what it is that they, how do they view it? What, what does this look like to them? It actually looks like shoreline erosion and loss of land. Um, but I mean, not loss of land because of inundation. That's the thing that's highlighting yellow. Um, loss of land, because literally the kind of the shorelines, like they crumble away, <laughs> they erode. Um, and so the land disappears, right? It's taken out by the sea. Um, so actually the way that people tend to think perhaps most frequently in sea level rise, or it's like literally the water goes up and it goes across and it floods, um, either recurrently or permanently is actually not what's happening in this location. Um, and you can see there's a wide array of what these impacts actually look like. So that person who mentioned that, yeah, well, you know, you're using the term sea level rise, but that's maybe not how they're thinking about it. You're exactly right, right? This looks very different. Um, everything from wells to, you know, um, stormwater drainage um, to, you know, even habitat loss. Um, how how this actually looks in specific place? Again, very place specific. 
So um, th this was a very famous story in the United States um, uh, um, during the Trump presidency. Um, so Tangier Island is a place in Chesapeake Bay, which is one of the world's largest estuaries, um, which is right um, in between the Eastern and um, Western shore of Maryland. And um, it is one of the areas that is very highly at risk from sea level rise. Um, and he basically uh, the, became very famous because he went on the news. As you can see, this the mayor from Tangier Island appeared at a CN town hall to tell, to tell um, Al Gore and actually also evoked support for Trump because um, Trump didn't believe in stuff like sea level rise. Um, but that it really wasn't sea level rise, but it was erosion that was doing in his Chesapeake Bay Island. Remember, just a second ago, I just showed you what people think, like the most, the highest percentage of people in the state thinks it looked like erosion. So that totally is in line with the, what the rest of the people think in the state. Um, but this also, this made a lot of news. Um, and as you can see, so he's living on a small island in the middle of Chesapeake Bay, and he's saying, I'm not seeing signs of sea level rise, right? Um, so this is a, um, this is an illustration of the different causes of sea level rise. Are all of these sea level rise causes related to climate change? I'm testing your natural science <laughs> background on climate change. I'll give you a clue in a second. No, right. So what's not? What doesn't belong here? If you're thinking about climate change, what is not related to climate change necessarily? Do a hint. Yes, tic-tac does play its Yeah, Teresa, you guys got it, right. So, um, so, there are a number of different things that are happening right to that contribute to sea level rise that are very climatically anthropogenically climatically related um so literally the water is getting warmer it expands right um we're having ice sheets land-based ice sheets they're melting they're sending the water into the ocean um circulation changes but we also have stuff that's been going on some of it for really long periods of time so um isostatic glacial shifts that are, especially in Maryland, we had a, um, a glacier that at one point had reached down just to above the state, and then it started pulling back. And when it started pulling back, the land started shifting downward. And so when we talk about sea level rise, we actually talk about relative sea level rise. Um, and that includes things like the land is also, it means the water is going up, but the land is also going down. Also includes things like we're pumping water out of the, um, or we're pump pumping out other fluids, um, oil and things like that, out of the ground, which again causes the land to compact. And you see that especially in places like Louisiana. Um, and so um, there's a recent study just came out a few months ago saying that actually some of these areas in, across that may not be seeing huge rates of sea level rise, they're seeing enormous rates of subsidence. And that's actually going to be just as bad for them because at the end, it's the relative sea level rise, which does you in. Um, so, in these case, in the Chesapeake Bay, because of these isostatic um, shifts, because they um, do the retreating glacier, they've actually been losing islands since 1850. They've been loss of more than 500 plus islands um, in the Chesapeake Bay because the land has been sinking. Um, and you also have things like erosion that have been having, contributing that process as well. So this is very much multi-causal, which also contributes to some of the difficulty in um, in risk perception and change, right? This place has been changing already for a very long time before we were really probably seeing massive impacts from anthropogenic climate change, sea level rise as well. Um, so the other thing I wanted to touch on is, I um, mean, we'll talk about the Tangier folks in just another minute, um, is that social vulnerability is something that we know from a lot of literature on risk perceptions um, is that there are fairly clear demographic patterns. Um, and it's one of the terms is called a white male effect um, in that you tend to see that white males have lower risk perceptions than basically everybody else. Um, and so again, so we particularly looked at, um, and this is a study of um, looking at 
people's perceived um, climate health impacts. Um, and you saw that we saw that. You know, so if you're a, um, if you're from a community of color, if you have less income, um, and also if you happen to be located in the floodplain, um, you are also more concerned about climate change um, health impacts. And that's something that's frequently, again, there's an assumption that people, especially who may be lower SES, they don't have as much time, there's other things in their mind, that they're not, uh, don't have as high risk perception from these issues. Um, but actually it's almost the exact opposite. We almost, almost for studies that have been going on decades, you see higher environmental risk perceptions from basically all other groups. Um, and you can think about, the, and there's a lot of questions like why exactly, um, but it does seem again, like it's a social cultural context, right? Um, you actually, there've been studies like in Sweden where they did some tests um, and you don't see the same, quite the same patterns um, due to a different social culture or context. So, um, so we're running out of time. Um, yeah, so what, we'll go ahead and do this. Um, what do you think, um, so thinking back to Tangier Island, and we've talked about these different, some of these different kinds, you know, these different factors that result in people's risk perceptions. What do you think might be some of the cognitive, experiential, and social cultural factors affecting how that Tangier Island mayor um, perceives sea level rise? So he said, no, this is just, this isn't sea level rise, this is erosion. What do you think, where, where is he coming from? What's feeding into that? And we're hype, you know, obviously we are speculating. So no hard data on this, but like if you had to think about small island, little Chesapeake Bay. Age, length of stay on the island, being blind. <laughs> but if you're seeing erosion, right? And you've saw, seen erosion, Right? You, if these people have been seeing other islands disappear since 1850 and you're seeing erosion, is that going to tell you anthropogenic climate change per se? Motivated reasoning? Cognitive bias? Okay. Connectedness of islanders with community. Right. And so, and there's actually, so motivated reasoning, and I will say I did not include this. So one of the factors is this island's also concerned about that if they is, admit that they're going to go under, right, that they also will lose um, financing to help um, support building, um, you know, uh, infrastructure to help support keeping the island around. So um, I will just say, you know, encourage you, like, if you're experiencing this, right, and you're seeing the same thing, you know, like, it, and this is not all of this is anthropogenic climate change, right? Some of this is also what's been happening for a very long period of time. It's also um, the land is also going down. Okay, so wrapping this up because I need to do that, um, so we can talk a little bit more. Um, my third point. So going back meta, right? So we talked about some of the factors that are probably relating to how people are thinking about this issue. Um, so I want to talk about sort of like bringing this back out to communication. Because one of the reasons why you do communication is to also then be able to um, give people more information about the social context, right? Knowledge, about the environmental context, um, and to facilitate things like policy processes. Um, so let's talk about that. And then also, especially about the role of social science, because I'm also biased on that, um, that I, I'm going to try and convince you that social science is also a good tool for this context. So, um, Adaptation requires multidimensional communication. I hope I don't have to sell you on that. Um, but there's actually, and especially if you look at, um, I hope you guys all know Eleanor Ostrom's work um, looking at collective governance um, of the commons and you know, of, um, natural resource commons. Um, you see that those um, situations in which people do it really well um, are rich in communication at the interpersonal and group level. And also um, if you think about some of her work, um, um, further extending that outward into problems like climate change, they also span different levels of governance, right? So that it's communication that spans different groups of decision makers as well. And so we're talking about a really, really messy pot um, of, of different tools that we're probably gonna need, of people that we need to reach, and it all has to somehow interlink. So it's a really messy situation. Um, however, again, going back to the need to cooperate, it's also one of those things we've got in our toolkit to help us do adaptation better. Um, so there are a lot of 
tools as you may already have run into. We have seal arrived viewers that happens to be taken from NOAA's. Um, I suspect you guys, um, the Canadians have them as well, as well as many other nations. Um, participatory mapping is another way of getting people together to figure out where impacts are, to be able to address them. We have our standard open meetings, right? Where we have people stand up and talk, sort of like this. Um, and then also sort of think more deliberative efforts like down below, and then um, also efforts at photo voice, which is a really neat technique where people take photos um, of what they're seeing to be able to communicate it with others. So there's, and I'm not, I'm not even covered with the fence, but those are some of the big ones. Um, so I'm just to mention quickly, um, community deliberation as one that we did a, a pilot study was in conjunction with one of these surveys. Um, again, Maryland-based, apologies, lots and lots of Maryland. Um, but this has an advantage of um, community deliberation is you basically bring lots of folks together into a room and you have them talk to each other and you give them information which has been specifically prepared to present um, uh, various points of view. Um, and then you, you had to do a survey beforehand, a survey afterwards to see how their views have changed, their novel level, level, knowledge levels, et cetera. In this case, we also, um, so we worked with the firm Dewberry that does FEMA, um, our agency that does flooding stuff in the United States, um, so that people could actually visualize the impacts to their homes, their neighborhoods, to area. Um, and we held this discussion on April 28th. So they had that information, they had risk information, which you can see here um, in the call out, you can see those little green and red. So if you're a red house, you're in bad luck. Um, and then they talked together in groups over the period of the day. Um, and what you're hoping is that knowledge will change, because if it didn't change, then you're kind of lost the game. So happily, we did knowledge did change, and we measured these folks on worldview measures um, as hierarchical individualists and egalitarian solidaritists. Um, and the, again, the hierarchical individualists are the folks that were worried about are pretty skeptical of environmental risks. But everybody um, increased in their knowledge, which was good. Um, and interestingly, we saw the biggest gains in sea level rise belief certainty from the folks where they hire call individuals. You get a little bit of a ceiling effect from the other folks, um, but we actually did see this, this change. And that could have gone the other direction, right? So if you put people in a room and they realize which identities other folks have, they might go back the other direction. Um, but we actually did see that they increased in, um, in, their, uh, in their belief certainty that sea level rise was an issue. And I think one of the things that was helpful is that we said there were two components to this effort. And again, it's messy. It's a messy communication effort. Um, so they had the viewer available, and then they also were able to participate in discussions with people. And again, this is a pretty small, again, we phrase it as a pilot, it's pretty small, it's at n equals 40. But you can see that people really liked the small group discussions. They generally liked the, um, uh, the um, you know, some of the other components as well as for the small group discussions, talking with other people was their favorite part of that day. So, um, so really, you know, just getting back to that, these are fundamentally social processes um, and that communication is critical to them. And it's critical to them in terms of motivating policy and a number of different um, components. So one, we need consultation in order to be make better decisions. And that would, why, why we need more than AI. Um, Decisions in which the public is consulted are considered more legitimate. Um, and political leaders are more willing and likely to go out further if they don't think that they're that far ahead of the public and their constituents. Finally, consultation is typically also required as a function of a lot of government mandates. So it's also things that people need to do. The problem with it is, and here goes my spiel on why social, social science is a good thing, is that when you're doing this, and it's a common problem in environmental decision making, not just sea level rise, is that you have to balance the need to have these very sort of tight interactive um, experiences with small groups that are really equally balanced in terms of power, in terms of partnerships and collaboration, with the ability to get broader reach. And that's specifically important if we want to ensure that we're paying attention to equity issues and that we are including diverse groups of people who may have less access and are less likely to be in those rooms. And so in those cases that actually things like surveys and things like open meetings are actually potentially better at making sure we're more representative. The other things that surveys are good at is that they also relay social consensus. So one of the things that we know is that 
social consensus is people actually are more likely to be supportive of climate change policies if they think there's more social consensus, not only of scientists, but also people in their own communities. And we saw especially there's been sort of a trend, again, this is Maryland data, that people that, who perceive higher levels of social consensus, their regional levels were um, a little bit more likely to then be some more supportive of um, climate change policies. So there do others also seem to be social scale effects, and that's another reason why surveys are important. It also tends to be rare. We don't see as much of it as we see in mitigation. There have been surveys for decades now, as you probably know, and you heard from a bunch of people who do them, um, on climate change, um, people's risk perceptions, and then also mitigation policies. There are very few um, on specific types of, of climate change impacts and also matching sets of adaptation policies. And this is just a couple of examples that we had um, from different parts of the country from a chapter that we recently did. I'm gonna skip that case um, just to wrap up here. So the lessons that we, we looked at um, four different cases around the United States from California, Connecticut, um, Georgia, and North Carolina about people who had done surveys in conjunctions with policymakers, um, policy groups, and some of the sort of findings that we had in terms of lessons for other folks so that we hopefully can do more of this um, is that you know these are just one right in terms of public participation surveys are just one right they're not perfect but they do enable us to get a little bit more representation we may hit some things we might have it's helpful to set clear project goals when you're working with these diverse groups um, aligning it with policy which is also sometimes tough for academics to do right Take a co-production approach. Again, it needs to be more collaborative. Again, sometimes tough um, for people coming from these diverse communities. Um, and then, fi then finally, you also have to be judicious in trying to interpret what the actual meaning is. Sometimes surveys are a little bit like TVs. So um, I really appreciate the chance to talk to you guys today. Um, I hope the sort of the main messages are here is that you know adaptation has probably played a really critical role in human evolutionary history, right? In some ways, you know. Um, stationarity is is dead. Wasn't you know? It, they probably had that T-shirt at some other point, different point in in human history, um, and that communication is really critical um, to you know our ability to pull our super strength cooperation um, into gear to be able to do this well. There are a bunch of different influences on risk perception adaptation that you can all address from different communication approaches. Um, and that's why we really, it's really critical for adaptation decision making. And it's also really critical that we build in some of these social science approaches to make sure that we do the best we can and also do it in ways that are representative of diverse communities. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was very interesting.